Um, are we? Do we want to? Do we need to record this, Sue? Are we already recording it? Yep, I just started the recording. Okay, perfect. So, welcome everybody. Um, thanks for hanging out with us as usual. I think that a lot of the stuff that we're going to talk about today will be not surprising, um, but a lot of it will, might be a little bit surprising. I'm I'm hoping to, to, you know, make this easier. The whole idea is, you know, giving you guys, you know, open source and flexible projects that are easy to work with and and just work. And a lot of the a lot of the changes in the in the improvements that we make, um, not everybody agrees are worth making. You know, a lot of that's just never going to be the case. And so we do the best we can to to simplify it, and so or to kind of balance that. And so today's main topic is about the structure of this new project as it compared to the structure of the existing project with iOS. Um, slowly over time, we're trying to bring these two projects, the iOS and the Android project kind of together and so that there's some consistencies and so that there's some kind of approaches to development that are that are the not they're never going to be exactly the same because they're two different platforms but at least things should be more similar than they were so a lot of the changes we made were thinking about that a lot of the changes that we made were really specifically for for plugin developers and I'll show you like the biggest one that I think is it's going to cause a little bit of headache for a couple of weeks but once everybody gets their head around it I think they'll be thrilled with it and so let's go right into it. Um, oh, and then the other thing was, is, you know, why did we do this? Of course, we know iOS 7 changed a bunch of stuff. And so we had to, um, uh, you know, take into account a lot of different things that we just didn't have to before. And as usual, it's taken longer than we'd hoped, but, you know, we're doing the best we can to deliver good stuff. So that's kind of how that goes. So I'm already sharing my screen. Is that right, Sue? Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Oh, one okay, more comment. Cool. If you can um, mute yourself. Then, then you can unmute if you talk. That way we get somewhere just on the background noise. Oh, okay. That makes Not sense. Not you, David. Everyone else. Mm -hmm. I get it. <laughs> okay, so let's review this project. Um, let's review this project kind of piece by piece is, you know, for the, the, with the significant changes in mind so that we can all get our head around it. Um, but before I do, this is the... Uh, Buzz Touch Core for iOS. I'm just going to hit compile and run, and I'm going to run it on iOS 7. And the goal is, and the idea is, um, you know, you shouldn't have to do anything other than download this project and hit run. That's that's the that's always the goal. It looks like I've already got it running. Let me run it again. Um, so what happens when I run the project? And when we run the Android Core without doing anything in it, we have a kind of a landing screen and an approach. And so one of the concepts was if I had an empty configuration file, this is what you get. So you get a Buzz Touch Core for iOS kind of landing page. And again, this is if you have the core with no configuration data. This is basically a blank config file. And this is what you get. And so, again, that's the same thing that you get on Android. And so what you do with this, of course, is entirely up to you. Now, most of us, most of us in the BuzzTouch world are going to be using a control panel to create JSON data to then, you know, control screens and manipulate all different kinds of things, but not everybody does that. And that's one of the concepts we're trying to get to. We're trying to make it easier to take a BuzzTouch core project with nothing in it and then extend it uh, maybe even by hand, right? You might just have somebody type JSON by hand, or you might have them point the data URL um, somewhere that already exists maybe to a file they've already created so that they're not using the control panel at buzztouch.com necessarily. So in order to do that, we had to have a core that would compile and run and put something on the screen without doing anything else. So we got that accomplished. The next thing that we have to accomplish is if you look at the build settings, you'll see that my deployment target here is 5.0. It was really, really important to us that this new project not just be iOS 7. And the reason is really, really important. I mean, it would be relatively, it would have been relatively elementary to just create a new project that was iOS 7 only. But with iOS 7 only, you really do cut off lots of devices. And we definitely didn't want to do that. And so we're going back to iOS 5 and above, um, which has some consequences. And I'll show you some of those as we explore this. But the biggest consequence is, you know, they look different iOS 6 and iOS 7 look different. And so when you're designing and creating your application, there are some subtleties and some nuances that might drive you a little bit crazy. If you wanted to only support iOS 7, of course you could do that, but 
our concept is, is you're going to download this project and it will work back to iOS 5 and on iOS 7. So I've compiled it and everything's cool. So let's get, um, let's get one thing going here so we can explore a little bit and see how this works. I'm going to open up the plugin that is displaying right now, which I've called Plugin Success. And if you looked at our config file, and you've done this before, you'll see that our item type is Plugin Success. So I know that's the plugin type. So that happens to be in the layout folder and it comes with the project. And here's the .h, here's the .m, and here's the nib file for that um, Plugin Success plugin. So what we're going to do is we're going to tap this image and we're going to see that it wobbles a little bit, kind of silly, but that was again, just to make sure people know that their device is capturing interactions. And you'll see that we're printing down here to the log, uh, you know, wobble image. That's the name of the method that I wrote. I'll clear that and click it again. Yeah, so we're wobbling the image. So that was the name that, um, the, of the method that I wrote um, when you tap the image. So let's look at that method. Plugin success, and you'll see here that this is our wobble image message. So instead of wobbling the image, I'm going to comment this out. Instead of wobbling the image, let's load a new screen. So we'll load screen ID one with ID one. Load a new screen when they tap this button. So instead of wobbling the picture, we're going to load a new screen. Some of you may already be noticing that a difference in how easy it is to load a new screen in this project compared to the old project, and I'll talk about that just in a sec. So I need to go to my config file and make sure I have a screen with ID 1. So let's make a screen with ID 1. So we'll say, well, here, I'll just copy this screen, and I'll make it ID 1. We'll do the standard uh, BT screen custom URL as a plugin because I've got that in my plugins folder. I'll give it a nickname. We'll just say Google, just like my standard little example. I'll give it a navbar title text of Google. And then the custom URL needs a data URL, so I'll give it Google. So we have a screen here in our project with ID 001. And when we tap the wobble image, on our plugin success screen, we'll load this Google screen. And I'm doing this for a reason. I want to show you here in just a sec, see if I messed up the JSON. Okay, so when we tap this, we're going we're gonna to load this Google screen, and then we're going to come back. So the first thing that you may realize, and we're running in iOS 7, so the first thing that you may have noticed, if you've done this before and you're kind of excited about code, is in our in our method where we loaded that new screen, you notice, it, I'm going to move this out of our way so we're not confused by it, distracted by it, I should say. Look how short that is. If you remember the old days, in, in the older project, we would have done something like BT, you know, view control, manager, view controller, manager, blah, blah. It was a big, long line of code to load that next screen. And we were using that class called the BT view control manager, or view controller manager class was used to load new screens. This is gone. There is no BT view controller manager class now. And that's a significant thing. For most of us who know how to program, it's going to be like, wow, that's awesome, because we automatically understand why that's cool. For some of us that don't, it might just be frustrating because you maybe just got used to it or learned it or something. So if you look at the layout folder, it used to have a BT view control manager in here, and it's now gone. The reason that it's gone, and Jake's asking what self is, and I'll talk about that right now. The reason that it's gone is all of the methods now have been moved to the BuzzTouch view controller. So these are all our little helper methods that we can use right as, you know, without having to call that parent class, the, which technically we would have said that those were class methods in a different, in a different class, the buzz touch view control manager. So we've thrown that away and we've moved them all to the parent class that all of our plugins inherit. So remember our plugins, the base class or the, the parent class is the BT view controller. So we have now 
all of these methods available to us, all these methods in the parent class, directly from code. We don't have to reference that view control manager thing. So we just say self. So getting back to Jake's question, what is self? Self represents this class. So self is BT plugin success. So we're saying self, load screen with item ID, 001. We could also say, um, you know, hide navbar. We could say self toggle navbar. And the reason I'm showing you this and the reason it's so cool, you notice that it has uh, code complete now works because, or, you know, the, the self, the code hinting, because we have all of the methods, whoops, in our parent class. We didn't have that before. So toggle top bar is a me method that's in your, in your, we'll just say both, and I'll show you what that means here in a minute. It's a method that is in your parent class and not in some other class, so it works in code. Your code hinting now will work, which is awesome. So toggle top bar is a method in self. So that means the parent view controller, and you can see here, toggle top bar, right here, takes one argument, we're calling them options, I'll explain those in a sec. And now tapping the image toggles that top bar. We don't have to have this big deep understanding of all of these other different class files. So in any of our classes now, we can use self, the name of the method, and then the argument without doing anything else. So that's super, super cool. Um, and that is a huge improvement from the other project that was, you know, we'd like to think that, that we engineer these things the best way, you know, available at the time, but all of us improve. You know, when I engineered that previous project, I thought that was the best way. And now I've learned over, you know, lots of time and lots of projects that, you know what, that just, that just confused things. And it just wasn't a very good concept. It wasn't the best concept. It was a good concept, but not the best concept. So this is our best effort at making it easier. So you'll notice that there are three plugins now in the layout folder that come with the core. One's called plugin success. We were just talking about that. One's called plugin missing. And so actually two, excuse me. So plugin success and plugin missing. This is also a big improvement. Let's say that our config file referenced a plugin that didn't exist. So let's say plugin success new, whatever. And we compiled our project and we ran that. So if we have a missing plugin now, you're going to get now this plugin not found screen, which is going to help a lot of people understand, you know, the classic example, they never added their plugins to their project and they download it and then they get the white screen and then they don't know why. So now we're going to show them this, which is the same thing as the Android project. So that's another improvement. It's, of course, we could demonstrate the same thing by making our custom URL screen, you know, making an error accidentally and not, not um, including it. So let's say we're on this plugin. We want to load the new screen, and let's say it doesn't exist. The data exists. The data exists for 001. That is right here. But this class file doesn't exist because it wasn't part of our project. And so we'll, we'll show you the exact same thing um, just kind of as you transition around screens and you can't find it. So you get the error plugin not found. So that's kind of cool. So let's talk a little bit about um, let's leave this URL here. Let's talk a little bit about the nav bar. The nav bar in iOS 7 is entirely different than iOS 6. So in order to demonstrate that, I'm going to give this Google page a background color. Oh, you know what? Before I do that, let me back up. I almost forgot. I almost forgot. If you guys remember in the older plugins that exist right now, we had to call in the view will appear method Every single plugin required, you know, set up background, set up nav bar, all that kind of stuff. These plugins don't, don't need to call that code anymore because our parent class does it for us in the view will appear. So our plugins can basically be empty and everything will just work. So that was kind of cool. So we've got configure background and configure nav bar, which are now two separate methods. They used to be configure background and nav bar in the view utilities class. So we've moved that and changed it to this part of this parent class, which will be be a lot easier. Um, Jake is saying, is there a method to disable that? Yeah, and it's just like regular programming, right? And view will appear. There's a lot of different things you could do to disable this. But what I would do is in my own plugin, let's say that we wanted to not set up the nav bar in the background. We'd just run, we'd write our own view will appear. 
and we would not call the super class. So that would not happen. Right? So now you wouldn't set up the background. Anyway, that's a tangent. I'm going to get off of there for a sec. So back to what I was saying, the nav bar. Let's talk about this nav bar because it's kind of a nightmare for a lot of people. It took a lot of time for us to figure out a lot of different things about it to make it work on both platforms. So I'm going to go back in the, and I'm going to give this a background color, this Google page. Background color. That's a weird orange, I think. Let's compile this. And we'll show that that background color does exist. So the background color for our Google page is orange, and you can see it when I pull down this page, which of course I could disable, but I just wanted to show you that that's, that is indeed back there. This web page uses a white background in the HTML, so Google's saying, hey, it's going to be white, but you get the idea if your page is transparent. They've got an orange background. But you'll notice the tab or the, the top nav bar in iOS 7, in essence, is transparent. Right? It's a transparent nav bar. So the problem that a lot of people are running into, and not just us, is if this nav bar were transparent, nav bar style, transparent, watch what happens. Transparent. It doesn't give you the results that you might want. So let me visit that and I'll show you what I mean and why this is so challenging. So if you'll notice here, Google's going behind, behind the top nav bar, but you'll notice the nav bar is no longer white because the background is behind it, and not everybody wants that. Watch what happens here if we do iOS 6. And this is the, the kind of the challenge in trying to balance both, both operating systems, the old operating system and now the, what we're calling the new operating system, is it's amazing how many problems this transparent nav bar has caused people because they're their views are showing up under the nav bar and they're, all of their UI components on their layout files are basically broken when iOS 7 came out. We, we experienced a lot of that stuff ourselves with, with you guys in our community. You know, what happened, to my, what happened to my view? It's hidden behind my nav bar, all that kind of stuff. So these settings were, were tricky to, to figure out and I'll show you kind of how we did it. Um, yeah, so this is iOS 6 and then this screen here has a transparent nav bar. And you can see, look, see how the Google page is under it? That's super challenging in iOS 7 and not necessarily ideal. And so, you know, we're open to suggestions on how that should work, but the way it works now, I just showed you, is Google's still under it, but you've got, you can see the background and not the page. Um, I just want you guys to know that it's not, it's not a trivial thing to try to get your design to work on both platforms. And I, I think that the general community most people is, you know, I don't like the transparent. They're forcing transparent nav bars on us with iOS 7 because it breaks all the layouts. But I've just been hearing that kind of online and throughout the development community. So I'm going to go back to iOS 7, and we're going to revisit this idea. So you'll notice how the web page is going behind it, but you can't really see it. I mean, it's there, but you can't really see it. So that's a difference. That's a difference. Let's take the... Um, project again and talk about some of the things that are different in this project. So the biggest significant difference between this project and the other project, aside from the general support for iOS 6 and iOS 7, is this file that's missing, the, the view control manager is gone. So that's a big difference. And then the more significant, or not the more significant, but another big difference as it relates to programming is this project uses ARC. So automatic reference counting is a really, really important concept. I'm just going to put it on the screen here for those who might maybe don't have the um, don't have their speakers on. So ARC, automatic reference counting, is on by default. This allows iOS set or iOS to manage memory automatically. If you'll remember all kinds of calls to the release, all kinds of method calls to this thing release where we would create something like this window right here, right? We're allocating a window, we're initializing it with a frame. After we used it, we would do something like temp window release. Well, you, can, you can't call release anywhere in your project when you're using ARC. And it's, the reason is, is you're, 
if you're using ARC is you're asking iOS to manage the references for you. Automatic reference count is what ARC is. And so you can't, you can't then try to manage the, the memory yourself, which is what release is doing. You're saying, hey, release the memory. So those are competing calls now, so they're all gone. The good news is you don't have to worry about memory anymore to, for the most part. Um, and, and you can more easily write this stuff without having to make all of these release calls. You also have a project that's the way that Apple wants you to do it. Apple wants you to, do, to use ARC. Um, the previous project was created you know, before ARC existed. And now that it does exist, definitely we move towards it. So you're not going to find any release calls. The bad news is, and this is only for ninjas, the bad news is, is there are cases where people really do want to have that fine control, lost fine control over memory. I can't think of any examples right now for this audience um, that, that, where that would matter, but I can tell you as a programmer, it is a little bit disappointing to lose some of that stuff because you know a lot of us programmers, we want to have precise control over everything. So we don't know when iOS is going to deallocate the memory for a certain thing. We don't know really how high it's going to let the memory get before it starts cleaning up. But we just have to trust that that's that it's going to be fine because Apple, um, you know, that's what they 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 want us to do. They want us to use automatic reference counting, so that's what we're doing. So I'm I'm stoked about it. It means a lot less code, but at the same time, there are there I have ran into cases where things were deallocated when I didn't want them to, and you end up having to check for stuff, and that's a whole other kind of conversation. Smug saying arc only or arc by choice. Um, it's that's a good question. It's it, it's set up for arc. Um, if you didn't do it arc, you would have I think you would have a bunch of problems because nothing's being released. So if you go down here for reference counting, see if I can find it. If I can spell, should be in build settings. Let's see, general capability build settings. It's just a choice in here. Can't find it. Oh well, not not important. But in your build settings, you'll see that you have um, a reference counting box checked. Yeah, here we go. Automatic reference counting. Yes. If you were to change that to no smug, you would have um, a, you know a bunch of warnings that things weren't being released, and I think your man, man memory would race. Not real sure, but that's probably what would happen. Another couple of inter interesting things as we explore this project. You'll notice now, too, that you have a header file. A header file basically includes a lot of the standard, uh, standard imports in your plugin file without having to do it yourself so you don't get confused. That was something that we didn't have before. Um, so when you're writing a plugin, for example, our, our, let's go back to our success plugin, notice that there's not a big long line of imports. You know, buzz touch item, view control manager, or, or view utilities, you know, strings, user, app, all those things we had to include. We don't have to do that anymore. So that's kind of cool. Um, that's a significant thing. The image assets is interesting in these new projects. And I was really on the fence. You don't have to use this, this idea called image assets. Let me show you what I mean by that. Right here for app icons, it's showing you in launch images, Basically, we're using this, this assets folder. So you have your icons and your launch images in a kind of a separate directory now. And they're calling it you know, an assets folder. And it's interesting how, how we see iOS and Android come together. For those of you who are understanding Android or have a, a little bit of history with Android, you remember already that you've got different drawables and different resources for different size devices. I think that's the direction that iOS is going. Um, and this seems to be just kind of a, the first step towards that direction. You used to just drag the images into your project and point to them with, you know, with Interface Builder, and now they've got a separate folder, and they call them app icons and launch images, and in theory you could make different asset folders for different devices. I think that's all coming in the future, but the important thing is, is in your settings now, um, that's kind of how it's laid out. That's how it's laid out. There's a new capabilities tab, and I won't, I won't go into this because this is not really related to a buzz touch project but if you're doing in-app purchase stuff it's giving us a warning because it's saying hey you've you've included passbook and you've included um, 
you know, game center and in-app purchase, but you've not given it an ID. I've not given it any uh, provisioning profile or anything like that. So that's kind of, that's why we have this no matching profiles, because this is our standard project. Um, anyway, so that's how that works. These are all the built-in libraries that we're going to be, that we're going to be kind of shipping with the core automatically. Most of the standard ones, most of them match the, the previous project. Not a lot of people ask us about those, but we can have that conversation if somebody wants to. Um, yeah, so let me, let me unfold this plugins folder. And we'll go back to our project here, and we'll talk about um, this view controller class again. So really what it boils down to is because every plugin in a BuzzTouch project extends the BuzzTouch view controller, and by the way, that's Java speak when you say it extends something. In Objective-C, you don't use the word extends, but anyway, it's object-oriented programming. I jump around between these languages and it gets confusing. So because everything has the BuzzTouch view controller as its parent, this is really the, the, the bulk of what's the significant improvement. Because this is its parent, then all of the methods in that view controller are available to all the plugins without any extra code. So you want to send an email, or you want to do a text message, you want to launch the phone call, or you want to load a screen with ID or a nickname or an object. So that's really um, I, I'm the improvement that I'm most excited about because that means that your code will just get less, uh, far less easier to understand. And in theory, in theory, it should use a little bit less memory also because if you remember that um, Buzz Touch View Control Manager class, it was passing objects around. I mean, something fierce, and, it, and it, it's hard to imagine that iOS didn't get a, had a little trouble doing that. So that's all gone. I'm thinking we can speed that up. Um, and then, of course, we've got the plug-in missing thing. And so that took a half an hour to talk about, and I know it's not really, you know, groundbreaking or revolutionary or anything like that, what we've changed. Um, but it is important that we brought everybody up to speed on this new, on this new approach that iOS is taking. And it is something that... Um, I think it's long overdue, right? It took us a lot longer than we thought, and now we're just gonna gonna start letting people download it in their in their control panels. That's not gonna be today. Um, it's probably be, probably be a couple of days until we start to see that stuff. There's a few more issues we're still working out, um, but I'm gonna I'm gonna turn off my screen. Well, I'll leave screen sharing on, but I like looking at the faces. And let's spend the la la last little bit just taking questions and kind of talking about what we just reviewed. Um, I mean, there's some some cool stuff, so. You know, I don't really know what everybody in the in the gang is thinking. I'll just kind of watch these questions. So Smug saying, will the import of external libraries be any different, easier with respect with respect to plugin development? Yeah, totally. I'll give you an example of that. Let's say that you're the person who made the custom URL plugin. If you look at the .m file, it has all these includes. You don't need these, right? You need some, but if you look at the prefix, you already have most of these things are already included. Right, so you don't need to, you know, color, user, device. You can just leave those out. And if you left that stuff out before, then you just get a big red error because nobody didn't know what you were referring to. And now, if you reference, you know, the BuzzTouch app or the the user or the device, then you won't get that error. A good question there. This update comes with BT Server 3.0. Yeah, that's the idea, right? Right now, the self-hosted panel does. This, I'll revisit this idea, Jake. Remember, there's a huge difference between the core project and the control panel. And the control panel only allows you to choose which project to download. It doesn't really have anything to do with what project you are downloading, because remember, that comes from us. And so right now, if you have 3.0 running, you don't have an option to get the latest Xcode project. You only have the option to get the current Xcode project. So we'll need to release a new download screen for the self-hosted people so that it has both options available. But that's, that's a fine question. Um, Tim's saying, when do we get it? Um, we can, Sue and I are happy to do with the same thing that we did with um, the Android project when we, when we had this meeting about the Android core, which was, here it is, everybody. Compile it. See what you can do with it. You can't get it out of your control panel, and you can't automatically assemble an app with it, but we're happy to give it away to everybody um, who wants to just play with it and maybe even discover things wrong with it and all that kind of stuff. It took us, how long did it take us before? Like four or five days to get it from this meeting to the control panel, I think. It was something like that after we learned a few things. But there's nothing about it that, that prevents us from giving it to you. Um, Smug saying, but if my project requires a new different framework, 
can that addition be automated or do plugin users still need to manually add certain frameworks? Ah, yeah, plugin, if the frameworks in the core are not, if you, if you have a plugin that requires a framework, let's go back here, that's a great question. And these again are the frameworks that are in the core. If a plugin requires a framework that's not in this list, then you're right, Smug, the, the, the owner of the, you know, let's say that you had a, had a, I don't know, a plugin that needed the core motion framework. Your, the instructions would still require the user to add that framework. There's some, there's some details about that. I've actually spent quite a bit of time trying to automate what frameworks are necessary and what frameworks aren't necessary for each plugin that's included. And there's, it doesn't sound that complicated, but we, what I always ran into was even though the plugins, like let's say you downloaded your package and all the plugins, all of the frameworks that were required were included, and the ones that weren't required weren't included in the download, really you're not gaining anything because most people are adding plugins and changing things after they get their project. So now they got to go back to the frameworks and add things just like they did before. So it didn't really seem like saving a workflow, but I totally know what you mean, and it's kind of one of those sticky points or whatever, but yeah, for now, if you make a plugin that requires a special framework, it just got to say it to the to the person who uses it. Say, hey, you got to go to got to go to build settings and choose this. Totally. Um, Jake's saying if you accidentally import something twice using the new prefix, will the compiler only include one of the header files? Absolutely. Um, the way I understand it is the compiler works just like using for those of us who know PHP, just like using the the call require once. Right, if you include a file or include a, like a header file on a PHP page, it will only do it once. Um, it's just to kind of prevent yourself from stepping on your own toes in terms of variable scope and all that stuff. So the way I understand it is, a, is Xcode does indeed not give you an error and only and it only includes it once. And we kind of proved that, right? Our custom URL is saying include the buzz touch color class, but it's already included in the header. So it's in essence including it quote two times without without seemingly without causing a problem. So maybe I'm wrong there, but I think that it's fine. Um, so I can't get it to yell at us with compiler errors or anything like that. Um, I do wonder sometimes. Really, some people think, you know, why why not just include everything? Why don't I just hit? This is a, a question that you don't hear very often in the forum, but, and I'm surprised actually. And we didn't hear it when Smug was talking about this plugin and the frameworks. Why don't you just include every framework, right? It seems logical that our BuzzTouch project would just say, you know, hey, all of the frameworks are included. Here they all are. Include them all. So Jake is taking a stab with a question mark after it. He's saying too much memory, and that tells me that there's a little tiny bit of lack of understanding about what frameworks do. And, and I'll say no, Jake, that's a good answer. But let's revisit what the frameworks do. Every one of these frameworks that you add to your project, or I should say none of these frameworks that you add to your project have anything to do with how much memory is used if they're not being used. If they're just not being used. right? They don't have anything to do with their memory. And so the next question is, well, won't, won't it make my download bigger? I hear this all the time. Won't it make my download bigger? It's not going to make your download bigger because the whole concept behind a framework is these frameworks are already on the device. They're already on the device. That's the whole point. Is when you click plus framework and you add, you know, the core audio framework or core data, you're not telling the Xcode project to literally copy all of the files and include them in your in your project, in your app. Mm -hmm. You're telling Xcode that you know this is on the phone and you want to use it. That's all you're saying. And so the devices, this list is supposedly promising us that if an iOS 7 device exists, I'm at iOS 7, all of these frameworks are available to be used by us as developers, and we just tell the, tell the project that that's what we want to do. So by adding it to the compiler, what we're, and this is why you can't just, you wouldn't want to just add them all. <laughs> so if you added like 300 frameworks as references in your project, it would take like forever to compile because what you're telling the compiler is, is look at my code and look at these frameworks and make sure everything's cool. And if you've ever compiled a project with like 150 references, you believe me, it's frustrating. Every time you hit run, it's, it takes forever because you're going through all, you're asking the compiler to review all these frameworks. So it doesn't have anything to do with memory and it doesn't have anything to do with weight. 
in terms of how heavy your project is. It just has to do with the compiler's ability to, to kind of get your app running in the simulator or on your phone and to kind of inspect your code. And so it's not really, it, it doesn't seem to make any sense to include them all because of a convenience thing. It's always a balance between convenience and performance, right? And so we're, we're just saying these are the ones, these, I mean, we're already putting like 15 or 20 of them in here, but these are the ones that everybody's using, and we're just kind of throwing them in there. But we're still, we're still going down the path that if you want to use an obscure one or an interesting one that's part of your plugin, no problem. Put it in the README, throw it in the, throw it in the, you know, the instructions or whatever, and we'll be fine. I think that's, I think that's the best approach for, for today. Only because, go ahead, Sue. Oh, I missed a question from Kitsy a little, a minute ago about, um, you, you can add a framework to your plugin. Yeah, it's just a comment. You can add a framework to your plugin similar to Erasma. Exactly. Oh, okay. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if that, you, but I like the bump library. If you use the bump library, you just throw it in with your the, the, the zip file you put and open it. It'll just download exactly with it. Once you drag it in, the framework's added automatically. Well, there you have it. See? There you have it. And so, so again, there's always a bunch of different ways to do things. And, and I, I think what Kitsy just said makes the most sense. I'll summarize it with, if you make a plugin that has a strange framework that's needed, not strange, but a, not a normal one. You could either tell the the owner of the plugin how to add it to their app using the using Xcode. Click the little plus, go to frameworks, drag it in, or you could include it in the in the download in the package. And when they drag their plugin into their project, it's going to be included automatically. That's a great tip. That's, good. That's a great yeah. tip. Yeah. The only the only risk with that is that people update the libraries constantly. They're changing. That's why it's always best to get it from the source online. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. And so, um, can the navbar color be changed with iOS in the new project? Well, let's see. Navbar color. We got background color. Let's do navbar color. What do we want to make it? I don't know. We'll make it the same color as the background. Actually, you know what? Let's make it gray. Nah, well, let's make it all. Isn't let's it make it navbar it. background color. Probably. I don't know for sure. I can't remember everything. Let's try. Let's see. I know the answer to this already, Jake. I just want to show you. So this is on our custom URL screen, and we have an orange background now for our nav bar. Yay! So we have a, we've got a, you know, this should still be this should still be white on the. See, there's a, there's a gotcha already. This should still be white. So when we came back, this nav bar did not update its color, and it should be white. Because there's not one in the theme and there's not one in the in the project. Um, in fact, now far let's make a white one on the on the uh, landing page just to make sure my suspicions are right. But there's probably a little update background update now bar like when the view did appear or something that I didn't include. Yeah, so that's that's a little funky. That shouldn't be that way. The, the, the number one time killer for us over this whole update, and that's, I've already added that to my little something not right list. The number one, so the answer is, yeah, you can update the color, but it's not doing it on back. The number one difficulty during this whole process is this top bar. It's completely, it's completely funky, <laughs> in my opinion. And, so, and the whole internet's like alive with this idea that it's just jacked. But not because it's, if, it's just so different. You know, everybody got used to the, all the method calls before, and you can't imagine, like, if you look at your code here, let's look at the update navbar method here. Update navbar, or configure navbar, I'm sorry that I wrote. One of the first things that I do is I say, is this iOS 7? Because everywhere in this code we're saying, if this is iOS 7, then, you know, the, the status bar style changes, the, the status bar translucency changes. Right? There's lots of different things that are related to iOS 7 only. If it's iOS 6, then we have to, if it's iOS 7, we have to say set hides back button equals false. There's all these different things that are just different. So we're constantly checking, like, which project is this on? And now it looks like we have to say, hey, if this is iOS 7, you've got to update your nav bar, back, your background for the nav bar color on back. Mm -hmm. Great catch. Great catch. Um, there was another comment in here. I recall having this error with previous projects, even with background color. Maybe. I thought the nav bar, 
maybe I'm wrong. Maybe my memory is wrong. If the, if you don't if you don't provide a background for the nav bar, a background color, and you leave the screen and you go to orange and you come back, it should update itself. It should it should take on the new color, and it obviously just didn't. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's some funkiness going on there. Mm -hmm. um, it's just frustrating for all of us, you and us, to try to to try to get all this stuff easy to understand. Um, you know, and, and, and so many of the iOS 7 issues are related to that top bar. It's kind of amazing. Anyway, good question. Are there any new features that are coming with this? Remember, we got the context new? menu um, on Android. Is there anything new that's new features? Yeah, this has the con this has the context menu support exactly. So you've got a little context menu option. Mm -hmm. um, really, fundamentally, it's just a project update. Just like the Android project, it's not about features. Features come from plugins, in my mind, at least. Mm -hmm. So features come from plugins, and the the everything else basically stays the same aside from the context menu choice. Um, one thing I did want to talk about, in fact, that we've got everybody in this audience who will who will embrace this. I think I really really struggle with this, but I would love to get rid of the I add automatic I add stuff. And everybody, there's two things that I would love to get out of the core, and, a lot, and I'm sure people are going to light up right now, going, "What are you talking about?" Um, the I add stuff I think needs to go away in terms of in the core. And then the other thing that needs to go away is that cheesy little two-year-old background audio player thing that we have, which does work, but it's basically now, two years later, it's like, this is crazy. We should probably just use an awesome background audio plugin, get some audio going, leave the screen, and have your audio. And so I think that ends up tricking people into thinking that, that it's awesome and, you, and it's the best approach, and it's just not anymore. So I'd like to get rid of that background audio um, plug-in and get rid of that background audio setting in your control panel and all that. Just make it much simpler and say, if you want audio, use this plug-in and you're way better off. And the same thing with ads. I think if you want to run ads, I think you're better off um, you know, with a third-party solution. I don't think iAd is the best way to go anymore. And like we haven't had iAds or, or a built-in ad network in the Android project ever, and it seems to be fine. So I'd like to get rid of the ads out of the control panel and the background out of the out of audio out of the control panel. I'm a little bit afraid to because I feel like the backlash. <laughs> Jake's saying, I've used iAd to make like a dollar a year. It, yeah, it, it just, you know, for the amount of work, it smugs in, it's a dollar more than me. And so for the amount of work that it takes to have it supported in the project automatically versus the payoff and versus all of the questions that it creates, it just seems like not a very good trade anymore. It feels to me like we should just say, look, we make a cool core. If you want ads, do this SDK. If you want background audio, use this cool plugin. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, don't be surprised if, you know, a week from now or whatever, that stuff's gone. <laughs> but I'm, just, yeah. I'm just saying that I'm afraid at this point to make that call. Um, and, I, and so far, Naraj is saying, yeah, dump it. I think this audience would embrace it. But I do think that there's a lot of people relying on it. If we take it out, then we're going to have to deal with that. You know, and so... Jake's saying, is there any way to plug in without a view that is called in the app starting before it loads the home screen? That's a fantastic question. It's a fantastic question. And the answer is not today, but we're definitely trying to make that possible. One of the, one of the cool things about the plugins is this idea is all it is is another view controller. Right? So it's simple to get your head around as a developer. It's just another view. The, one of the problems with the, the current plugin thinking is it requires a view controller, right? In most cases, if you're making a plugin, it needs to have a screen that displays to the user. And as we've all learned this year, we don't necessarily always want that. So Jake's saying, you know, hey, I want to, you know, I want to put some cool custom code in somebody's app delegate, like when the app first launches, but my plugin doesn't really allow me to do that. Totally understand. So what we're really trying to work out is, is what, we're, what we're calling core plugins. And so the idea would be some plugins have view controllers and there's things that you look at and interact with. And other plugins have no UI or, or what we would the nerds would call a headless plugin, right? Nothing to look at, no screen. And, and then the question becomes, where does that code go? So clearly that code would, would you know, be in the app delegate because that's the only kind of global file. But how it gets injected in there and how it doesn't compete with other code that some other developer put in there starts to get really dicey. The good thing about a view controller is since you've made it, 
you can pretty much do whatever you want in it without having to worry about competing with other views because it's kind of packaged up and it's yours as the plugin developer. But when you start talking about letting people just arbitrarily add things to the delegate, it really does muddy the waters a little bit. And so it's totally coming. It's absolutely on our radar. It just isn't available right now. Um, you know, now we all know that you're constantly telling people, oh, put this in your delegate, right? It's just part of the dialogue. We cut and paste and throw things in there all the time. Um, but in the control panel, which sure be nice, Sue came up with an awesome strategy, oh. which turned out to be an awesome strategy about eight months ago, which will definitely pay off when we get to this core plugin concept. And that is all of you guys and girls, gals, have been, pre have been preface prefixing your class files with, the, with your developer initials, in essence. And so because of that, we're getting kind of used to that, right? We Our images have this prefix at the beginning of them. Our class files have this prefix at the beginning of them so that we don't collide with other developers. And so the same thing could be said when you're adding code to the delegate file. As long as your code is, like, for example, a method name, you know, set whatever, report to my server, whatever, you, whatever your cool method is, um, as long as it's prefixed with, with your initials, no, no idea. then it, it's logical that Kitsy and David and Joe and Jake can all have our own little methods injected into their delegate without conflicting. Mm -hmm. It's not exactly that simple, but that's kind of the path that we're going down. So if you make a core plugin that does something cool behind the scenes, that, that would work, right? But it, believe me, it's more complicated than that. And so, but yeah, so we had to get iOS 3, you know, 3.0 for Android, 3.0 for iOS. We gotta get the self-hosted market going, which by the way is now like ever so close because of this thing getting done. And then we can start thinking about these other new awesome features, right? Like the core and all that kind of stuff. And so Smug saying context menu is like a right nav bar button without the right nav bar button. Um, yeah, I guess. And so context menu is like a right nav bar button without the right. Yeah, if you look at the Android project, it's just a button that appears in the top right bar. And when you tap on it, it opens a list of menu choices that is configured in the control panel. Um, Epics Web, can you say show a demo? Actually, I can't. This builds. doesn't. I don't want to type all the JSON out for a menu and all that. I don't have a, a handy cut and paste spot. Um, you can you can compile it when you get the project and add a menu in there. I just don't feel like typing at all. <laughs> so, because the menu, you got to type the menu, then you got to hook it to a screen, and you got to do the context menu ID. I hear what you're saying. I don't see any other gnarly questions here. Um, there, was there a way to distribute this to um, to us first so that we can do some testing for it before you distribute it to the Yeah, project? I think what we should do is exactly what we did with the Android project. And Sue, I'll, I'll give it to you. You can chuck it up on the Dropbox. You can give everybody on this you know, on your developer list, a link to it, and they yeah. can get it. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of different threads that got crazy long with, like, all these types of questions and, like, when's it coming? Because, I don't know, a month ago I said it was a week away or something like that. <laughs> but there's these, these, these crazy long threads. We should probably start a new thread saying, you know, 3.0 feedback or whatever. And so, because we want to now do just the same thing we did with Android and try to discover. My biggest goal is you should be able to download it and compile it without any warnings. That's the goal. And so we haven't even talked about the, you know, the 50 plugins or whatever that are obviously not in this project. Those are, those are not all updated. I'm still going through, hacking through things. Um, but I think this audience can certainly understand the difference between, you know, calling a method that used to be in the view controller class or the view control manager class that is now in the self, right? There's a lot of those little updates that are need to be done syn syntax-wise that I've started on, but there's a lot of them. And so what we don't want to do with this forum post is get, is turn it into questions about plugins. And that's what always happens is, you know, you make a post up there that says 3.0 comments or whatever, and then it's, my map doesn't look right. It's like, you know, that's a map question. That's not a core question. And so it's challenging to, and I understand, you know, we're all trying to do the best we can to kind of keep this going. But I suppose we should probably start a new thread called, I don't know, 3.0 compiler questions or something or comments. And plus, it's okay to open a new new thread too, so they start totally. to get, like to hopelessly yeah, long totally. too. Totally, because those things get so long or whatever. Um, Raj is saying I joined forty minutes later. Did you solve the child items? I'm not sure what that is. 
Um, Sue, can you add me? All oh, these are just conversations going on. Yeah, I'm, uh, but yeah, I, I absolutely I can package this thing up and give it to Sue, and we can do a download URL. That would be awesome. That's kind of the goal. I mean, I did that. I've been doing that a lot with some of our teammates and learning a lot already, like Danny and Chris, um, Buzzcast Chris. You know, they've been found some things, and I think you know people who are smarter than me, like well, Kitsy, for example, is like super ninja. He'll find all kinds of ways to make it better in the next few days, and so um, which is cool. And by the way. Before we hang up this meeting, I know a lot of you in this um, hangout weren't in London or Oxford, I should say. Did I have the time of my life in like a day? Sue and I, are, how blessed are we to get to go over and, and meet Thomas and meet Kitsy and meet just a fantastic group of people. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't want to go through all the names because I'll definitely leave people out. Um, but what a, what a neat, amazing, um, just warm welcome, you know, they gave us. and. I don't know that I'll ever travel halfway around the world again for a six-hour hangout, um, but you know maybe I will. Maybe I will. It was it was unbelievably cool. And so there's and Tim. Is, he just took the words out of my mouth. Tim's saying you got to come to Sydney. I know Kristen's been trying to get me to go to Australia, and there's some other people in Australia. Um, <laughs> I, don't, I mean that's like 20 hours I think in the airplane. Aww. I will say this: if I ever get to Australia, it's going to be more than for one day. Because mm -hmm. that was just ridiculous. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. I didn't want to go, you know, but I had obligations and things to do. It just didn't work. I needed to, I both wanted to go over there, but knew I couldn't stay. Um, but I'll tell you what, I could hang out with, with Kitsy and the gang and Thomas and the gang and forever. Those, those people are really, really sweet. I, there was a little bit of language stuff, you know, here I thought, okay, I'm going to go to another country, you know, kind of for the first time, and I'm going to go somewhere where they speak my language. They don't speak my language. <laughs> so it was, now I'm convinced that it doesn't matter where I go. I'm gonna I'm gonna sound funny, and they're gonna sound even funnier. So I'm I'm gonna go somewhere else. <laughs> but I think you told stuff. Sandeep you come to India. Go to India. I totally want to go to India. He talked about that. Um, so far on the list is India, um, Germany for sure, mm -hmm. um, Australia, and now we have Italy kind of thrown in there with Derval. Mm -hmm. Derval's saying, hey, we can do this in Italy too. And so it really just you know, I'm not embarrassed to say it. It comes down to money, right? I just don't have enough money to travel like this. Yeah. So I definitely have the passion and I definitely love it. Um, but it's just a lot of money to, to buy plane tickets, um, you know, any, anywhere outside of the United States. It just is. And so Tim saying we're our own country in <laughs> Texas. Yeah, that's for sure. That's for sure. We could totally do it like a Dallas hangout or whatever. That would be fun or like the Alamo or something. That would be cool. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, it, it's not a it's not a time thing or a money thing. It's I mean a, a an interest thing. It's just the money. Right? It's really really expensive to travel once a month, um, and that's kind of what we what we would have to do. So mm -hmm. we're focused on as far as meetup goes. We have the San Diego thing coming up that I can get to pretty cheaply. Uh, Mr. David, awesome. I'm I'm hoping Jake will be there. I know there's a bunch of a bunch of names. Um, yeah, look at Durval saying meet up on the Med September 14th. Come sailing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is just that is like crazy that she's saying that to all of us because we'll get so many people there will sink her boat but uh -huh. <laughs> for those of you who have not met Durval I mean what an amazing amazing part of our community and to finally get her meet her in person uh -huh. um, I think we all know the difference when when we just say you know high quality people right that meeting in London was a room full of high the highest quality people you will ever meet and that's kind of the key right we don't have um, let's just say not high quality people coming to these meetups. And that's, I think we all can sense that when we meet each other and, and, and get to know each other a little bit in person. I mean, we're all ultimately trying to do the same thing. You know, we're trying to make great software and we're trying to kind of carve our way through this app world. Um, and we all have our unique talents and skills and, and we're all high quality folks that when we get together, it really is meaningful and powerful. It's awesome. Even if 